Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss folate metabolism. So first we're going to see how we actually get tetrahydrofolate, and then we're going to see all the various things that we can do with that tetrahydrofolate. So it suffices to say right now that tetrahydrofolate derivatives are going to be used extensively in all sorts of biosynthetic reactions. We're going to see this when we cover amino acid biosynthesis. We're going to see it in nucleic acid biosynthesis. And they're used to deliver one carbon at a time. Um, so there's a variety of forms of tetrahydrofolate that we can see. This one at the top, this one N5-methyl, N5-N10-methylene, and then this N10-formal are probably going to be among the most common that we're going to see. But the key is tetrahydrofolate derivatives are going to deliver one carbon at a time. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's first talk about how we get tetrahydrofolate. Um, humans cannot biosynthesize this. Um, this is something that we have to obtain through the diet. And it's going to be obtained directly as just folate, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as folic acid. So folic acid, uh, before it can actually be used, has to be converted to tetrahydrofolate. This is accomplished through two successive reactions of dihydrofolate reductase. So first, folate is reduced with NADPH to dihydrofolate. And then it's reduced a second time, again with NADPH, to tetrahydrofolate. And this is going to be done in the liver once that folate has been absorbed. And then the tetrahydrofolate can then uh, be run through this pathway in a variety of ways to generate a variety of different coenzymes. So here's our tetrahydrofolate right here. We're going to worry about going down the bottom here. Um, some of this is a little bit convoluted, um, but hopefully we'll clear it up. But I will say that these two at the top and then this reaction right here are probably the three most important to know. All right, so the first reaction going down here is catalyzed by N10-formal tetrahydrofolate synthetase. So this is going to convert tetrahydrofolate into N10-formal tetrahydrofolate. Notice that we use formate to attach this carbon-oxygen group right here, and then we have to use ATP in order to complete the reaction. So that gives us N10-formal tetrahydrofolate. We're actually going to see some reactions particularly in nucleic acid biosynthesis, I believe it's purine synthesis, where we actually have to use a couple of these. And we're going to use this to actually donate this formal group, and that's going to allow us to transfer one carbon at a time. Okay, So this one is directly usable in, in quite a few reactions. But we can actually process this further into some uh, less common metabolites, so let's go over those now. So first of all, we can have this reversible enzyme called cyclohydrolase. Going in the right direction, this can convert N10-formal tetrahydrofolate into N5N10-methanyl tetrahydrofolate. Now, what I want you to notice about this, and it's a really slight nuance with the name, this is methanyl. The one we're going to see up here is methylene. Um, if you're looking at it really quickly, it's easy to uh, actually not notice the difference. Methanyl is really more of an intermediate. We're not actually going to use this, okay? Um, but N5N10-methanyl tetrahydrofolate. We're going to see two things that can be made from that that are used to a lesser extent. Uh, going to the right here, we have this enzyme called cyclodeaminase. So in the right direction, it actually uh, attaches an ammonia group. And so we convert N5N10-methanyl tetrahydrofolate into this N5-formamino tetrahydrofolate. And again, this can also be used to transfer one carbon, but it'll also transfer a nitrogen in the process. Okay. Going downwards, we can convert N5N10-methanyl tetrahydrofolate into N5-formyl tetrahydrofolate. Now, this process is catalyzed by cyclohydrolase, okay? or at least it's a side reaction of cyclohydrolase. Okay? Um, this doesn't happen to a significant extent, and for that reason, we're really not going to see any reactions that utilize the N5-formyl form of this. We'll see the N10 form will be used. Okay? So if we ever get some of this, we actually have to convert it back to N5N10-methanyl tetrahydrofolate. And this is catalyzed by this enzyme, N5N10-methanyl tetrahydrofolate synthetase. And in order to get it back to this form right here, it's going to have to utilize an ATP. Okay, so um, come back to this in a minute. 
there's a really important form of this tetrahydrofolate shown right here. This is our N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Um, this one's extremely important because this is actually directly used to synthesize thymine or thymidine, which is, of course, the T's that we see in DNA, the nucleotide. So this is extremely important. And being extremely important, there's going to be two reactions that are going to allow us to generate it. Let's talk about this one right here first. So going from N5N10 methanyl tetrahydrofolate, going upwards to the N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate, we're going to have to use the reducing power of NADPH and this enzyme. N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate dehydrogenase. So going in the direction upwards, this is actually a reduction reaction, and we use the electrons from NADPH. Of course, this reaction is reversible, and in that process, we'd actually generate NADPH, but for the most part, we really want a lot of this because we have to generate a lot of Ts for DNA, or thymines. So it's usually going to go upwards. Now, there is another reaction to generate this N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate, and that's the reaction of this serine hydroxymethyl transferase. Now, here we're going to look at it from the perspective of the tetrahydrofolate. When we look at this again later on, uh, we're actually going to look at it in the context of amino acid metabolism. So notice what's happening here. Let's suppose we want to catabolize serine. So we're trying to break down serine for energy. It turns out in that pathway, serine is converted to glycine. Okay? Glycine can then be converted to other things, but serine is catabolized to glycine. So in that process, it turns out that tetrahydrofolate is going to be converted into N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay? So that's actually a process we see in serine catabolism and that's catalyzed by serine hydroxymethyl transferase. So yes, we can go down here and go through actually three enzymes to get this coenzyme right here, or we can do it in one process or one step if we're doing serine catabolism. Okay? But like I said, this N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate is going to be extremely important for thymidine synthesis, for DNA synthesis. Okay? Now, this we can take one step further and reduce it again, except this one is uses NADH, or the reducing power of NADH. And this one is catalyzed by N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Okay? So what this does is converts N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate into N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay? So this form of the tetrahydrofolate is extremely important because it's going to allow us to generate S-adenosylmethionine. I have a separate video where we discuss S-adenosylmethionine, or SAM, in something we call the SAM cycle. But it turns out that if you look over here with the enzyme methionine synthase, we can actually generate methionine from homocysteine via this enzyme, which, notice, utilizes N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. So this coenzyme form of tetrahydrofolate is going to be necessary to generate s adenosylmethionine okay? s adenosylmethionine is the universal methyl group donor. So if you're methylating DNA, if you're generating, or let's say biosynthesizing creatine, which is used in skeletal muscle, pretty much every methylation reaction you could possibly think of uses the methyl group from s adenosylmethionine But in order to generate this, SAM, as we call it, you have to first generate N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay? So that's very important. Okay? So coming back here, that's why we have to generate this. Okay? Even though this will donate a methyl group uh, to homocysteine to make methionine, um, you have to have this first as a precursor in order to generate this SAM. Okay? So to generate SAM, you have to have N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. And for this reason, among others, folate intake is extremely, extremely important. In fact, individuals who are pregnant, who actually have a deficiency of folic acid in their diet, can actually cause their infant to develop neural tube defects. It's extremely, extremely important. Okay? The other thing I'll just mention about this enzyme methionine synthase is not only does it require 
N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, it also requires the enzyme B12, or cobalamin. So these are both B vitamins. And so for that reason, oftentimes folate deficiencies um, can have similar effects to B12 deficiencies, although there are some other effects of B12 deficiency that we don't observe with folic acid. But for some of the deficiency symptoms, they actually overlap quite a bit because of this enzyme requiring both of them. Okay, But for now, hopefully you have a good understanding of folate metabolism and how we actually need the active form tetrahydrofolate, but then we can take that tetrahydrofolate and process it into several different important critical derivatives that we can use in all sorts of biosynthetic reactions. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.